Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Always a good day to be here in the Lord's house. We're continuing our study of Acts. We're in uh, chapter 13 this week with a focus on the first 12 verses of the chapter. Uh, we're talking about missionaries, talking about churches sending out missionaries. We're going to start with the first three verses. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean who had been brought up with the Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Sorry for butchering the names, but... As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So the setting here, where we're at, we're in Antioch. And you remember a few weeks ago in our lesson, we talked about when the people were scattered from Jerusalem and they went out to, to found other churches, they went out to escape some of the local persecution. One of the churches that was established was the church at Antioch. And he mentions here in our text to remind us that the church sent Barnabas to Antioch to investigate this great work that was going on. They had heard about the church at Antioch and they sent Barnabas there. And Barnabas sought saw, saw Paul who was still being known as Saul, who was at Tarsus. You remember when he left Jerusalem, he went back home. He went to Tarsus and to come and work with him at the Antioch church. And it makes mention too that the, the city of Antioch has been called the cradle of Christianity. This is, this is about 10 or 12 years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's where we're at. So the church has been there for a while, it's been established and establishing itself. And what we see here is they've got prophets, they've got teachers in the church, they've got people that are, are preaching the word and explaining the word. And he names off some of them here. And he says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, they weren't fasting for anything, I guess, other than the fact that they wanted to get closer to the Lord. They were, they were doing their work in the church and they were fasting to focus their attention on God's will. They were, they were seeking what God wanted them to do. And the Holy Ghost said, separate me from this and Saul for the work where I called them. So the Holy Spirit called Saul and Barnabas to another work. They were busy in the church working. They were very involved in the church. They had a ministry right there in Antioch, and the Holy Spirit called them and said, I've got something different for you to do. The Holy Spirit, in what I've read and, and the, different, the different commentaries about this week's lesson, and I've never really put much thought into it in this manner, but the Holy Spirit calls people that are extremely active in God's will. The Holy Spirit's not going to call someone the sitting back in the chair in the recliner in the back or, or wherever just watching everything going around them just watching everybody do a good work for the Lord the Holy Spirit is not interested in someone that's not actively doing work and you know, we are all to be about God's will there's something or there's a work that God has for each and every one of us might be here, might be in the neighborhood, might be halfway around the world. We don't know until we get involved in God's work and we get involved actively seeking God's will, and then he's going to tell us what he wants us to do. And that's what he's done here with, with Barnabas and Saul. He's got to work for them. And when they had fasted and prayed, when they had focused their attention on what God's will is, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So not only did Barnabas and Saul focus on what God's will is, they felt the calling. They knew they were called. They talked to the people of the church. These folks that are, that are ministers there, as well as the entire church, they talked to them and said, we're being led by God to take another work, to, to go somewhere else. 
God has a work for us to do. And they all prayed about it, and they all fasted, focusing their, their thoughts and their minds on what God's will is. And they all laid their hands on them. They all blessed them. They all understood, regardless of how much they enjoyed Paul and Barnabas being with them, regardless of how much they enjoyed the, these leaders in their church and their involvement, that it wasn't what they wanted, it's what God wanted. They all realized this, and they all laid their hands on them, giving them encouragement and support, and they sent them away. They didn't send them away in a... You know, sometimes when you say, you know, I sent them away, it was, you know, a bad connotation to that. That I sent them out of here because I didn't want them around here anymore. But they sent them away in, with encouragement and with prayer. And they, they sent them on their way knowing that they were fulfilling God's will. That they were going to be led by the Holy Spirit to go somewhere else and to continue the work that they had started there. They had released them from their obligations there in the church. And I, I, I got to thinking about that comment about they released them from their obligations in the church. I remember, um, and here we go, start forgetting names all of a sudden. The pastor that married us, Stacy. Richard Hamlin. Yeah, see, yeah, now I get me. If I look at my wife, I just find out. <laughs> I hadn't been a member here at Mount Zion for that long. Stacy and I, this was after we got married, but uh, everybody remembers uh, Richard Hamlin that was here then. But I remember, uh, was it not on Easter Sunday, I believe? Or was right, it was either Easter Sunday or right around there when he resigned from the church to go and start a, a, start a mission. And I remember a selfish thought right off the bat. I was like, it was almost like, well, you just married us and you just got, I just, you know, we just, we just got started in this life and I really enjoyed listening to your preaching. Why would you want to leave us? You know, that was a selfish thought. It, I, I, my first thought was not, oh, how wonderful it's going to be in this town for these people to have a new mission work there and to have someone sharing the gospel with them have someone new that and you know that was just my first thought and then I got past that and saw but you know that's I, I, I hope that that's not a lot of that going on I hope that people don't express that I never said anything to him of course but I would hope when someone feels called by the Lord that that there's not people there you know being selfish about it and wanting to keep them and retain them but that there's people there wherever they're at and wherever they're working, feeling exactly the same way as these people at the church at Antioch. They were supportive of the mission work. And they laid their hands on them and they prayed for them and they blessed them. And, you know, it's... I just... I, I hope I've grown spiritually since then to understand God's will and to understand the first thought is about God and others and then myself third. I also remember when we were seeking a pastor here at Mount Zion and I was on the church committee and I was calling different different folks to come and view of a call and I remember we had done some some talk we had visited, we had done some interviews, we had listened to sermons and such and I remember the night I called Brother Donis and you know I've thought back on that many times about what that church thought, but I called him one night, and it took a few minutes to answer, and then there was all kinds of noise going on in the background, and he was at a basketball game. <laughs> you know, he was principal of Sheridan High School, and he was doing what principals do. He was at a basketball game, and I called him and and asked him, and that we had uh, we would like for him to come and preach in view of a call, and uh, we had prayed about it. He had prayed about it, but. The, First comment that I remember him making was, well, that's great. He said, I just figured y'all gone on past me. You know, he, he I don't know if he was continuing. I, I didn't ever ask him about how he was praying about this, but and he but he had thought that we just moved on to someone else. And I'm so thankful that he was accepting of that phone call, that he answered it in that noisy gym that night. And 
and uh, was excited as he was because I think he's been a tremendous blessing to our church in the many years since then. But it's just, you know, when we start talking about mission work, we're talking about God's work. And the one thing that you can count on in working with God, working for God, working through God's will, seeking His will in our lives and, and trying to walk in the way He wants us to walk in this world, is the, the thing we can count on is things will change. Things will not be laid out like we think they'll be laid out. <clears throat> if we're seeking His will, He'll present it to us and it, I promise you, it won't be what we thought. It'll be what's right, though. It'll be what should be. And all that to just say is it was really came home and listening to these guys talk about starting a mission work and going off and how the church must have responded. And I'm so thankful that they did respond in the manner that they did to lead us where we are here today. And in verses 4 and 5, so they, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salon, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also they had also John for their ministry. So the first thing they did, they, they had to leave town. They were going to Cyprus. Well, Cyprus is a little island that sits 60 miles off the coast. So they had to go catch a boat to get there. And so that's where they went. They went to the port of Seleucia. They caught a boat. And then they sailed to Cyprus. Now, an interesting thing about Cyprus is that's Barnabas' home. That's where he's from. So sometimes, sometimes in God's work, he has a place for us to go that we're real familiar with. And it might be that before you push somebody out of their comfort zone, they need to have a comfort zone. Before you start pushing somebody to expand their work, they need to start their work. And a lot of times, God understands us human beings. He created us. But he knows that we need encouragement along the way. We need assurance along the way. And one of the best ways to do that is to start with something familiar. And so they sent them, they sent them to Cyprus. It's, there's a huge Jewish population there. There's a lot of folks that need to hear about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, this man from Nazareth. And so they sent them to a place that Barnabas, at least, was familiar with. And then they were at Salamis. I told myself I wouldn't butcher that. I looked that word up to make sure. I didn't know if it was Salamis or Salamis. And then I, I <coughs> you know how you sit there and you say, don't do that, do this. Don't do that, do this. And, and then I started off the wrong way. Anyway. But Salamis is the way I read that it was to be pronounced. And, you know, if you say Salamis, somebody thinks you're talking about a sandwich. You know, it's a salami, we're getting hungry. But they went to Salamis. That was the... The main city on the east side of the island. So that was the first city they would come to. And they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. You see, we're calling Paul. We're, we're down the road. Some of this they call him Saul, some they call him Paul. But we're about to just start calling him Paul all the time. But he was a, he was, he grew up in a Jew. And he knew the scriptures. So he was allowed to go into the synagogue to talk, to preach, because of his standing in the, with the Jews. And because of his standing, he could go into the synagogues and share, the, and share with people. And what he was sharing with them was the gospel. And he would go in there and tell them how it was. But that's where, that's where they started. But you remember that that's not where it's to end. It's to end and into all the earth and into all the world. And so they go and they preach in the synagogue and they get people's attention. They get to talking to people about this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There were people there that needed to be saved. It says here 
It was a familiar territory for Bonner, but Cyprus being his home, and they could have been told there to go by the Holy Spirit. I feel like they were told to go there by the Holy Spirit. Of, of you know, if, if you're a missionary, I don't think a missionary just picks and chooses where he wants to go. He's sent by the Holy Spirit, and it just so happened to be his home, like I said, to, to be able to start with something familiar. And there were people there that needed to be saved in the church in which they needed to serve. And he goes on to talk about the author of our text here about how hard mission work is. It's hard enough, I could just imagine, to go into a place that's totally strange to you. It, it's all going to be hard. It's just different levels of hard. So, so they're there. And they preached in the synagogues. And then they're to go and talk to the others. We we'll pick up in 6 through 12. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, this is the city on, they, they traveled across the island, so now they've gone to Paphos. This is the city on the west side of Cyprus. This is the capital city of Cyprus. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. So they ran into this guy that was a sorcerer. He was Not a good guy. They've run into these type of people before. And he's a false prophet. But he, he was a Jew. And he told people. And he used that background as some type of authority. Whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now that bothers me when I read through that. And the first thing I'm thinking of, well, Bar-Jesus. What, what exactly does that mean and why? So I get to looking at it. And what that means, is Bar-Jesus, what that means is the son of Jesus. So he's saying that his, na his father's name is Jesus. Well, when you get to looking in there, archaeologists, Jesus was a fairly common name back then. It was a transliteration of Yeshua, uh, Y-E-S-H-U-A. And it was a transliteration going from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English. And that's where we get Jesus. And it was a fairly common name, as I said at that time. Archaeologists have found 71 tombs in the central Israel with the name Yahshua on it, with that name. So it wasn't a connotation to be talking about Jesus Christ. It wasn't anything related to that. It was just that was a way of saying son of Jesus. And I watched this show about these Vikings and all them. Everybody's heard of Leif Erikson, who, you know, traveled to North America and all that. Well, his name, we've condensed it down to Leif Erikson, but his name was Leif, son of Eric, Eric's son. Not son of Eric, but Leif Eric's son. That was how they called people. And so this is <laughs> right along those lines. It's just saying that that was his father's name, Jesus. And even today, uh, in the Hispanic community, uh, there's a lot of people named Jesus. They spell it J-E-S-U-S, -S, just like we spell Jesus. But we don't get mixed up on Jesus and Jesus. We don't confuse those two. Uh, Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. This guy was making no claims towards Jesus Christ. He was just a false prophet that they ran into which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. So Bar-Jesus was traveling with this guy who was actually the Roman governor of the island. This was the guy that was in charge of the entire island. And at that time, a lot of, a lot of the officials that were in, they would like to know about the visitors. They knew when there was a stranger in town, and they liked to, you know, you see the old West movies and the sheriff goes out when there's a new stranger in town and he wants to know what his business is. Why are you here? You know, is he a gunfighter or something? Are you here to cause trouble or problems or are you whatever? But so the governor of the island, he's wanting to know what these new folks in town are doing. So he he's there to meet them along with this bar Jesus. But the governor was a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. He had probably heard a little bit about them. And he wants to know why they're there, and they're there to talk about 
this man Jesus and about the word of God. So he wanted to hear for himself what they had to say. But Elimus, this is Bar-Jesus, this is what his actual name is. But Elimus the sorcerer, for his name, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. He knew who these guys were, and he knew that they spoke God's word and that they were there by God's will. And he had he had the ear of the governor. He was he was quite tight with the officials, and his life was quite easy because of that. And the last thing he wanted was somebody there speaking the truth to mess up his life, to mess up his program. And he was, so he was seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, we might as well get this out right here, right now, where he says he's also called Paul. Like I said, uh, in the past I always thought that Saul's name was changed to Paul when he accepted Jesus Christ. But he continued to be called Saul for 10 or 12 years. That's, that's who he was, Saul of Tarsus. And he went by that. But <clears throat> Paul taught people in the synagogues, but Paul also taught the Gentiles, the people of Greek origin, the, the others around there, and the, the Hellenistic. And their name for, for Saul, their, the Greek name for Saul was Paul. And I also read that you had three Roman names. And Saul being his first one, I, I didn't look up or write down what it's ever, but his, his last Roman name was Paul. And so that's where we're at here. He, we're going to start going by the name Paul. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So we have Paul, who's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's there on God's work, lays his eyes on the sorcerer, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. He's not calling him the son of Jesus now. He's not calling him Bar Jesus. He's saying, you're not the son of Jesus. You're the son of the devil. He, he's talking down to him. He knows who he is, and he's pointing it out for everybody to know, and particularly for the governor of the island to know. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? You know, Satan had tried to stop the church many times, and it always failed in all those endeavors that we've been talking about the last few weeks. But here we have the Holy Spirit leading Paul to stop Satan from, from coming out, from perverting the word that they were there to spread. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Paul called on the Holy Spirit, and he performed a miracle right there. It's kind of ironic that the miracle that's performed is blinding him because that's what that's what got Saul's attention was being blinded. He's not blinded this time by bright light, by the by the presence of the Lord. He's blinded this time by the power of the Lord. And he's blinded for a season. It's not for for life, it, it's just for a period of time. Saul was blinded for a season. He was just blinded for a period of time. And not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. His reaction to his blindness from the power of the Lord was much different than Saul's reaction to being blinded by the Lord. <coughs> he was blinded and instead of calling on the Lord and realizing the error of his ways all he wanted to do was somebody to take his hand and lead him home he still didn't get it he still didn't understand what had happened to him he still didn't want to give up his ways you know we can preach the gospel we can share the gospel 
We can talk to people. Sometimes we talk to them many times. But it's still up to them to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. We can share with them the truth, and that's what God wants us to do. But it's not our responsibility if they accept or not. That's God's work. That's their choice. <coughs> and we, we need to follow God's will. We need to do all that he says. He says everyone in the world will have the opportunity to hear. That's paraphrasing. But everybody will hear the gospel. But we know everyone doesn't accept the gospel because we also know how the story ends. And we know when Jesus returns, there will be those fighting against him. There will be those that refuse to accept the gospel, that refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. He wasn't set. The governor wasn't saved because he saw the results of the miracle. That didn't. All that did was justify the gospel that had already been shared with him. All that did was was help him to know that that's the truth. That was the affirmation of the gospel. Him seeing you got two different worlds here. You got two different stories. You got this guy that he's calling the son of Satan and you got Paul speaking of the gospel. It's kind of like in the past when the prophets of Baal went out there and did all they could to call down fire. And then we let God show them how it's done. Soak the wood and call down fire and it lapped up all the water and everything else. That's what was going on here. Paul showed the governor had already heard all of what this other guy, Elimus, had said and had to say. He'd already heard his side of the story. And now he wanted to hear from Barnabas and Paul. And he heard their side of the story. And then they showed him just who was who. In my words. He believed being astonished at the doctrine. He believed the doctrine of the Lord. Not just the miracle there. The author of our text goes on to say, Missionaries encounter all types of people. Some are prudent and wish to hear the word of God, as with Sergius Paulus. Others are enemies of righteousness and with deceit or even violence oppose the work of God, as with Bar-Jesus. This is what makes the work so challenging. But people will hear the gospel and be saved. Churches will be started. This is the glory of success of mission work and what keeps missionaries working. That's what it's all about. Following God's will. Whether you're the one on the missionary field or the one <clears throat> supporting the missionaries. He goes on to say here in our closing, mission work is God's work within churches. Men must answer the call of the Holy Spirit and be willing to go. Churches must obey the Holy Spirit in separating these men and sending them to work. These churches must pray for and financially support these missionaries. They also need to be there, they also need to be a place and people. These missionaries can learn, lean on for encouragement and support. It's not just one time, and it's not just some money, but it's support. Just like the church at Antioch, where they laid their hands on them, and they prayed for them, and they fasted for them, and they focused on God's work. Sometimes I have a, I've heard people excuse the church of their membership for not supporting mission work in any way but saying what they, that they have enough mission work to do locally. They just... Say, well, we can't take care of that over there because we still got stuff to do right here at home. Likely, these people are not involved in local efforts either. Others might excuse not evangelizing locally by saying the church of their membership sends lots of money to missions, so it's not the other way. We can't do something around here close because we don't have the money, we send it all away. That's not the right attitude either. Mission work is not an either-or situation. It is a both-and we are to be working both locally and worldwide. Remember when the Lord told the Jerusalem church, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, 
both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That was his words. You're working for me here. You're working for me outside your neighborhood. You're working for me pretty close to where you're at. And you're working for me all around the world. In other words, we're to be ready to go wherever Jesus might send us. Wherever God's will sends us, we need to be ready. Whether we're the one called to do the missionary work or we're the one called to support the missionary work. We're to be ready, and it can be anywhere. And I also wanted to just add, I'm sure everybody has seen about this story and read a little bit about it and heard a little about it, but it's, it's kind of fascinating. I always think of missionary work as going out to the people and, and sharing the gospel with them there, but that you reach out and go. And, and I've also read different ways that people do missionary work that's quite fascinating, like the group that goes out, and I've mentioned before, and, and drills water wells and gives fresh drinking water to peoples that don't have it. And they just show up in the community and they provide them safe, clean drinking water. And the people start asking them, well, why'd you do this? What? Why would you do this for us? And they open their ears and they start sharing. And they tell them why they're there. And they start sharing with them about this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But in the last week, week and a half, there's a university in Kentucky, Asbury University. And I don't remember exactly how it got started, but they were having a they were having a revival. And they basically got told that you couldn't do it in the way you want to do it. And they didn't pay attention to that. So they started this marathon revival, you might call it. And it was started by some young college students. You know, some of those people that sometimes would think they might not know what they're doing. They're just youngsters, you know. But they, they had a revival. And the Holy Spirit was moving within this revival. Because we don't always know, we can't understand how the Holy Spirit can work. We can't understand. It's not for us to judge while this is going on. We can know the Holy Spirit's working by seeing the fruits of what's going on. And they started this. And they continued with it. And then it started spreading out into the community. And then it wasn't just students of the church of, of, of the university going to the chapel and supporting this round-the-clock revival, this round-the-clock services, people in the community started joining in. They wanted to go and see what's going on. It got their attention. There must be something to this. And so they started going. And then people from around the counties around and around the state, it's still going on. The revival is still going on right now. And there's people from all around the world traveling to this little chapel at Asbury University. And it's spilled out of the chapel and into the courtyards and into the grounds around there and into the other churches in the area. How long have you been going on? A week and a half. Amen. They've had to open up at least three different buildings. And that, that's the last I heard Friday. Yeah. It's just amazing that we can see the Holy Spirit working. And Lord knows we need to see the Holy Spirit working. And how in regards to everything else that's going on. But it just struck me that sometimes, and I don't know if that may be why some people question or whatever, but it looks to me like it's missionary work in reverse. It's look what we got. And people from, instead of going out into the world, people from all around the world are coming to this little chapel in this university and seeking and finding revival in their lives. And man, it's just, Amazing how the Holy Spirit will work, can work, as long as we're seeking God's will and following God's will. We never know what He has for each one of us in store, what He wishes for us to do, what He wishes for us individually and as our church. I don't know. Y'all want to have the round the clock service? See if we can get going here? I don't know. I'm just, 
not falling on their backs, but we need to understand that there's, we have no limits here at Mount Zion. We have no limits as individuals if we're seeking God's will, if we're following God's will. We have no limits because God's power is limitless. And we're seeing it work. We saw it at work right here in the scripture we looked at today, and we see it at work in Kentucky right now. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit can do. With that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful for this opportunity to study your word. So thankful, Lord, for you to show us your will, for you to show us your word, for you to show us and encourage us and affirm to us <coughs> to share with those around us, to go into the uttermost parts of the world, and, and to, Lord, to show us not only in your word, but through your actions right now today in our backyard. I just pray, Lord, that as individuals and as Mount Zion, that we seek your will and all that, that you have us to do, that all the works that you place before us, all the opportunities, and that we will seek your wisdom, your strength, and your power to fulfill all that you have in store for each of us. I thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. I ask forgiveness of my sins. And in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.